Speaking of content, I think today's program is probably one of the most important programs for the entertainment industry right now. Without content, you have nothing. You have chaos and anarchy. Without the ability to create and protect content, there is no entertainment industry. Uh, a couple things logistically, you have uh, an exceptionally fine packet of uh, cases and some pleadings and other materials. In particular, I do want to be sure that uh, you, when you have a chance to look at it, that you, you take good note of the, the two articles by Steve Lowe that really are the reason we're here today, the death of copyright and death of copyright, the sequel. Uh, as Adam mentioned, you know, in connection with my treatise, I have to read a lot of stuff, try and stay current. And I was a fan of Steve's before I even met him, because if there's one thing that's hard to do, it's to take an entire legal trend and make it clear. And these articles by Steve are, are truly gifts to the profession. They are required reading at the UCLA Entertainment Law Program. Uh, and duly so, and it's not often I'm a fanboy, but I think the first time I realized I was in the room with Steve, I went right up to him and said, oh my gosh, I've read your articles, I really like them. Was that, was that uh, surprising to you when that happened? It was. Yeah, okay, well, it, it was well deserved. So uh, this is actually a program that Steve put together. Uh, he asked me to moderate. I can't take credit for any of the wonderful panelists and topics, so I do want to start by acknowledging that. So thank you, Steve, for us. Thank you, Gary. So, Death of Copyright started as a uh, research project in the summer of 2010. I asked uh, my summer interns, one of whom has uh, since become an attorney and is here today, uh, Danny Lifshitz, who has also co-wrote the second article, to try to find every case against a studio in the last 20 years involving a screenplay uh, and find out what the result of that case was. So, uh, the interns found about 60 cases. And uh, I asked them, I said, well, what were the outcomes of the cases? And they said, well, the studios won every one, basically. Uh, there was one exception. Uh, there was a case that uh, Mr. Kulik handled, a case called uh, Miller versus Mir Miramax, the Shakespeare in Love case. And he actually prevailed in an unpublished decision, but available decision, and it's in the materials, uh, on a motion for summary judgment for Shakespeare in Love, a very lengthy opinion. Uh, by uh, Judge Pragerson. Uh, other than that, the other approximately 60 cases, and there have been quite a few since then, uh, all uh, ultimately were resolved in favor of the studios. Now, two of those cases, the Ninth Circuit reversed the lower court, and that was Shaw versus Lindheim in uh, 1990, and Miller, I'm sorry, and um, Metcalf versus Bochco in 2002. What happened with those two cases, in Shaw versus Lindheim, the uh, plaintiff actually made it to trial. But, um, and won, but the court did a uh, judgment notwithstanding the verdict, and so the studio prevailed. The other one, Metcalf versus Bochco, uh, they did make it to trial after the Ninth Circuit reversed the lower court, and um, they lost, fair and square. So, other than this Miller versus Miramax case, we have, we're not able to identify a single case in the last 20 plus years, now it's another three years since then, um, where the plaintiff prevailed in a case against a studio uh, involving a screenplay. So what we did was, the next thing we did was we said, well, why is this? Why, what's going on here? And what we found was basically three things. Um, number one was that, as Corey mentioned, the judges are not accepting uh, the, the opinions of experts on the issue of substantial similarity. They're disregarding them, and they're making their own decisions, which they're entitled to do. And maybe this is the only area of law in which they are entitled to do that. They completely disregard on motions for summary judgment the plaintiff's expert who says, yes, there is substantial similarity. And they act as their own literary critic. And if you look at the opinions, you'll see, in opinion after opinions, the judges basically dissect the two works themselves and come to their own conclusion. Uh, and for some reason, those conclusions always seem to end up in favor of the defendant. The second thing that started to happen uh, in about 2006, uh, which is the Funky Films case, is that um, they start, the court started looking at dissimilarities. There's a, a rule that says that, um, that a plagiarist cannot excuse his wrong by showing how much of, uh, he contributed to the work. In other words, the courts were only to look at the similarities and not look at the dissimilarities to determine whether there was copying. 
Uh, in 2006, starting in the Funky Films case, the court started looking at dissimilarities for the first time in order to make the decision. So the law was evolving uh, to a place where they were getting away from some of the basic tenets of copyright law and starting to look at dissimilarities. But the main reason that um, plaintiffs always lose is because the court had essentially, in, in 1992, the Ninth Circuit basically um, mangled what's called the selection and arrangement test. Now, the selection and arrangement test was required by the, uh, by the United States Supreme Court in the Feast versus Rural Phone Book case. Um, that was a 1991 United States Supreme Court decision. And what the selection and arrangement test is, it basically says, well, we understand that some of the elements may be unprotectable. Um, they might be ideas, they might be scenes of fair, they might be historical facts. But if you select and arrange them in a certain way, the, copy, the, the whole of that selection and arrangement may be copyrightable under the selection and arrangement test. If there's a sufficient pattern of non-protectable materials, you can get a, a, a copyright in the protectable whole. Well, what happened is in 1992, the Cavalier case, the court actually Im implemented what's called the, fil the filtering test or the screen out test, in where they screen out all the unprotectable elements first before they do a comparison which is exactly the opposite of the selection and arrangement test, which includes all the unprotectable elements. <coughs> so once you screen out all the unprotectable elements, needless to say, there's never anything left. And because everything's been done before, there's nothing new under the sun. And so plaintiffs religiously lost these cases basically since 1992, once the filtration test was implemented, even though it directly um, went in the face of um, the uh, Feast United States Supreme Court case. So basically what you have now is you actually have four tests uh, with the Ninth Circuit. You have the selection and arrangement test, which has been approved uh, by some courts, the Metcalf versus Bochco court and others. Uh, and these four tests are actually set forth in a reply brief, which are in the materials. Um, so you have the selection and arrangement test, which has been occasionally applied. You have the filtration test, which has been applied multiple times. You have the filtration test with screening out, uh, I'm sorry, with including consideration of dissimilarities. And then you have a fourth test, which is basically, well, we'll only apply the selection and arrangement test under certain conditions. And those conditions are either admitted access, that's the Rice case, or in one court, a lower court, has said we'll only apply the selection and arrangement test if there's virtual identity. So there's basically now four separate tests, uh, as I just mentioned. The only one that would allow plaintiffs to actually have a shot at winning would be the selection and arrangement test. But there's these other three tests um, that exist, and the courts um, apply the other three tests just as often as they apply the selection and arrangement test, and mostly don't apply the selection and arrangement test, at least in cases against studios. Which brings me kind of the final point, which is that we brought this up recently to a judge uh, in a case called Rogue, um, sorry, Siegel versus Rogue Pictures. And um, the judge actually agreed with us in denying attorney's fees. She found that the, the law, quote unquote, lacked clarity, um, that had she applied the test that we advocated, which of course was the selection, selection and arrangement test, she may have ruled differently and also found that there were quote unquote numerous similarities. And that case is currently up on appeal and we're hoping that the Ninth Circuit now is going to clarify which of the four tests uh, is the correct one. We're obviously advocating the one that was implemented by the United States Supreme Court in the Feast case in 1991. Just briefly, um, first of all, I wanted to thank Allison for her ideas for future articles. Um, terrific. Um, this whole concept that it's supposed to be 50-50 is not what we're saying at all. It's, it, it, you know, it just so happens that the percentages work out where it's 60 cases or actually probably more like 70 cases now to one. Um, but all we're saying is that um, the court should be applying the right test, which is the selection and arrangement test, and that's the test that's required by the United States Supreme Court, and they're not. And because you cannot have one test that screens out unprotectable material uh, elements and another test that considers them. They are mutually exclusive tests. And then there's the other two as well, which we won't talk about. 
Um, in terms of cases settling, I, I do get that all the time. I think Glenn will agree with me that these days uh, they usually like to take it a, a, a shot at a motion for summary judgment before they, they are, are willing to settle. Um, very rarely do these cases settle early on. Uh, I've only seen it maybe once or twice uh, in over 20 years. Um, also in terms of Allison's uh, position that it's creator against creator, I, I don't entirely agree with that. It's creator against, you know, a thief as far as I'm concerned. Uh, not, not creator versus creator. I rest my uh, case. So, um, you know, because that's what happens. So the, the powers that be in Hollywood, they run out of ideas because there's an insatiable, you know, uh, voracious appetite for ideas and for, for creativity. And when they run out of it, um, they have to go other places, and one of the best places to go is unsolicited submissions and even sometimes solicited submissions. In fact, uh, we were actually told by um, uh, one of our experts that what the studios do sometimes, or at least some companies do, is they send their unsolicited scripts over to their coverage department. Uh, the coverage department does a summary, and then the summary is submitted to the executives. If the executives like the summary, they give the summary to a new writer to actually write the screenplay. Uh, knowing that ideas are not protectable and all they're doing is taking the quote-unquote ideas rather than the expression of the ideas. Which is my last point, which is the, the difference between idea and expression, I think Glenn pointed out, is, is a very difficult line to draw. In fact, some people have said as soon as you express an idea, and then, then that's the expression of the idea. Um, certainly when it becomes very abstract, like uh, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, that kind of thing, Presumably that's an idea, but as it starts to fill in with, with a little bit more details, which is the case, certainly in the cases that we take, and I know in the cases that Glenn takes, uh, they fill it in with a lot more uh, specifics. And by the way, the Binet case it is a great case. It's, um, it's, it was amazing to me that the plaintiffs didn't win in that case. Uh, they're both the same title. Uh, the similarities are overwhelming. Uh, if you read the briefs for that case, there were actually some historical inaccuracies that were in both. Uh, the screenplay and the uh, the movie. So uh, I guess I will rest on that. I heard Steve Lowe say that the Ninth Circuit has it wrong and that the federal bench has not been following the Supreme Court test. But uh, silence is an admission and I didn't hear anything from the defense side <laughs> responding to that very fundamental point which is what caused maybe the death of copyright. Does the defense admit that the Ninth Circuit has it wrong and that all those cases that Joel has been winning are based on the wrong test? Cut. All, in, all in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm what sorry that we lost one. We, we screwed up on one of them. I don't know how we did it. What's interesting is that the Supreme Court test that Stephen is citing, the selection and arrangement test originating from Feist and further elaborated upon in Metcalf, is actually not that easy to satisfy either. If a court is applying that, it has to be the whole selection and arrangement, so if you will, the whole sequence of events needs to be similar. So it's, I don't know that it's materially different as far as the outcome goes. Although that, I know Stephen but at least, well, that, that's at least, what I meant earlier when I said chance. that the, the, the similarities have to be pervasive. That, that's what I meant. Right. They have to sort of carry through for a good part of the work. And in my mind, you're probably not going to win if, if it's just a scene or two or something isolated. Well, I, I think the, the court's decision in the, in the Siegel versus Rogue the, on the attorney's fees issue is, is very telling because she actually said, Judge Fisher, she said, had we applied, well, first of all, that the law, quote unquote, lacks clarity. Had we applied the, the test that we advocated, she might have ruled differently and that there were quote unquote numerous similarities. So I do think uh, it's hard to satisfy the selection and arrangement test, uh, but at least it gives the, the writer a fighting chance. <laughs>